Life is about keeping yourself challenged. Life is hard. Difficult things are going to happen to you. Uh, if, if you purposely do things that are mentally difficult, then you're going to be mentally stronger for when the non-purposeful things about life come and get thrown at you. Lube your chain and pump up those tires. It's time for Aging on Dirt, where we defy expectations one pedal stroke at a time. We age, but we don't have to get old, and we all want to experience the joy of mountain biking as long as possible. Are you starting to ride an unreasonable age, getting back into it after a long layoff, or just wanting to extend how long you'll be riding? Then you're in the right place. And now, your host, Joel Z. Welcome back to the show. So one of my regular series of episodes in this podcast is about local aging riders called Tales from the Trail. In this one, the guest is, well, me. So uh, this the, this podcast was never supposed to be about me. Uh, it's supposed to be about my guests, uh, what they have to share to help us ride longer, have more fun with fewer injuries, and also share their adventures with us. It wasn't going to be about me. But over the last several weeks since the podcast was uh, has been launched, I've been overwhelmed with the number of people who have said that they want to hear my story. Uh, and I kept asking, but why? Uh, and I still hesitated to do this. Uh, it took me uh, weeks to, to set this up, thinking, who's going to be interested? And then I realized that throughout my life, I've had many people inspire me who never knew that they were inspiring. Or if you'd ask them, they'd say that their stories weren't inspiring. So I'm doing this for those of you who may be inspired and make some positive changes in your lives, and not necessarily just about riding, um, because of my story. My friend and riding buddy, Scott Stinger, agreed to interview me. Uh, he and I have similar riding backgrounds, although he's a lot faster and more serious racer. Um, I'll be interviewing him, actually, for a Tales from the Local Trails episode soon. Uh, we seem to have a, a pretty good flow together, so uh, which is hopefully going to make this more, uh, a more enjoyable listen compared to me just going on with a monologue. So I hope you enjoy and learn something that impacts your life from this conversation. Here you go. Let's welcome, well, me. All right, Joel. Tell me why... You started riding, and why you chose mountain biking? That's a really good question. So I, I remember very distinctly. So this is where we're going back probably about 10 years. Prior to that, so I would be like 49, 50. Prior to that, I had literally a completely sedentary life, um, which is, you know, you've We've been friends long enough, and if you, if our listeners and you follow me on Strava, it's hard to imagine, you know, with the three or four rides that I'm doing a week now, and have been for quite some time. Um, but I was uh, a good 50 pounds heavier, and I remember very succinctly thinking, uh, sitting down somewhere with Anne, uh, and being incredibly uncomfortable in my own very fat body. To the point where, you know, I felt like I was a sausage stuffed in my jeans and thought, you know, something's, something's got to change. I was on high blood pressure medication to keep the blood pressure down. And I just, I basically had this thought of, you know, in five years, I'm going to be five years older. Five years is going to be here like that. You know, you're old enough, you know, that as time goes by, the years just seemed to go faster and faster and faster. I had flies, yep. And I thought to myself, you know, what kind of condition do I want to be in? How do I want to feel? What do I want to look like in five years? And realized that something had to change. So uh, I didn't actually start with mountain biking. It started with controlling my diet. Um, hooked up with a buddy and we started uh, playing racquetball for cardio. And he started in introducing me some, just some basic um, weightlifting stuff in the gym just to start uh, increasing my metabolism a little bit. 
Uh, and then somewhere along the, wa- the way, I thought, well, uh, I like to ski, so I love the mountains, which is why Ann and I moved here from Michigan. Mm-hmm. And just so others who don't know, Ann is Joel's wife. Thank you. <laughs> Yet to be introduced on a podcast, but it, it's on our, our list to, uh, to do one. Uh, either her or both of us together in our story, we'll see if that happens this year. You were a skier? Yeah. So I thought, okay, well, I, uh, I like being in the mountains, so I love to ski, and I know how to ride a bike, mountain biking. And I thought, okay, so I'll try it. So I lost probably about half that weight over the course of six months, you know, just in time. So I started like in the fall and then the winter went by and started, the spring came along and I lost about half the weight. And I'm thinking, okay, I could probably jump on a bike now in, uh, and try it without killing myself. So bought a used 26er, um, and almost died on, uh, my, one of my first rides up, um, uh, green pond made it about a mile and a half and thought, this is so much freaking work. What is going on? When I started riding, uh, the, the guy who got me started took me on what he called an easy ride. Sure. And we went to green and it was not in the sun at all. It's funny looking back now because it's such an easy ride other than, you know, there's a couple of rocky sections there, but really it's a pretty easy Way back then, I hear you. Oh man, for sure. And then, uh, so I wasn't totally hooked, um, but I got hooked because I went to my local bike shop, uh, and complained about the hard time I was having on Green Pond. And they looked at my bike and they said, you know, you got 20, if you got 29 inch wheels and they, they had only been out for a few years and just starting to get popular, uh, you'd have a lot easier time. So instead of like me learning the actual technique on the, on the, on the rocks and stuff, just try a 29er. Uh, and just come in during the week and we'll just give you one for free for the day. And it's like, you know, it's like the, the, the drug dealer on the corner. Oh yeah. Your first, your first one's free, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that was it. I mean, the, the difference between riding those two bikes was completely night and day. So I went in that afternoon and said, you know, what do you got? I'm, I'm ready to buy one. This is, and I was, I was hooked from, from that point forward. That's awesome. So. You switched from skiing. Well, I guess you didn't really switch, but you were still skiing in the winter, lost some of that weight, and then switched to mountain biking. Did that, was the mountain biking exactly what you needed to take your health improvements the rest of the distance? Pretty much that did it. I ended up getting a road bike too, um, somewhere in that timeline. But the, the mountain biking was, uh, uh, got me the other, the other half of the 50 plus pounds that I end up losing over, over the course of the year. And also by the end of that first year, I was off the blood pressure meds, which I didn't honestly think would ever happen. And for the first time since about 1990, I was in 34 inch jeans. Five years later, after uh, continuing to ride and increase the distances and increase my load and capacity. I had my VO2 max tested and I was uh, over 53, uh, which I guess is uh, pretty phenomenal for uh, for someone in their late. Certainly much better than the couch potato I was before. Awesome. Yeah, that's cool. So you talked about Green Pond, mm-hmm. and how difficult it was when you first started. Um, I know because we've been friends for a while, we've ridden together a lot, but you've improved a lot over the years. So what are the, what are some of the more challenging rides that you've taken recently, or maybe that you're looking forward to? Um, well, I would say probably the, the most challenging and rewarding was, um, I think it was 2021. I did, um, uh, the 12 hour Aldelsi ride, and this was before the most recent course change. So it was uh, when I could still get a lap in in under two hours. And I got, uh, and I, I trained for that. I mean, I was, I was working toward that for the four or five months leading up to it, doing really big rides and felt really good going into it. I mean, I'm not fast. I mean, in, uh, any races that I'm doing is more just for the, for the challenge and the say that I did it. Um, 
but um that was that was 12 hours on the bike pretty much the whole time it, it took me i got five laps in in like 11 hours and 50 minutes <laughs> same year i also because uh, that was in july so in the fall i was cocky and went and did uh, a, a mid-mountain ride uh, at park city and i had done several from mid-mountain over to the canyons and then taking the bus back and i'm like i'm gonna go i'm gonna do it both ways and I was underfueled and underwater or watered. Is that a word? <laughs> it is now. It looks like you one. <laughs> and totally bonked on that ride. And, and really, that was probably the only ride that I bonked on. I mean, the 12 hour El Dose, I was, I was good through the first four and felt really good. That fifth lap really got to me. And it, it was about two and a half hours for me to complete it versus the other ones I did in, in, uh, in under two. Uh-huh. And I stopped off and, but it, I mean, I didn't really bonk on it. It was just like, okay, I'm tired. I'm going to sit here for five minutes before I keep going. I've been there. It hurts. Yeah. And that was, you know, the, in the, in the last part back was on brim, just on that climb. And that climb felt like five times steeper than yeah. it is. Right. Yes. I've been there. I was just a a few times myself. But this, this, uh, mid mountain ride was very humbling because I, I thought I was, you know, I'm still in great shape from, from El Delce. I'm just going to go and nail it. And I didn't bring enough food. I didn't bring enough water. I didn't eat enough in the morning. And, and I, I didn't think I was going to make it back. And probably the next most challenging ride is, uh, I don't remember the time frame on this. I had a buddy come out from Philadelphia. He wanted, uh, and I met him down in Moab to do the whole enchilada. And I think I did, I told you this when I was, when we did it last year uh, with, the, with the four of us, with Darren and, and David. Uh, we got there and he said, okay, Joel, um, I'm going to go for a PR on this ride. So you're on your own. So I'm doing the whole enchilada basically solo the whole time and no idea what they expect. I've never seen it before. Never seen it before. Uh, uh, I ended up riding, running out of water on that one for an hour and a half before I got to the end. Um, so that was, that was challenging and frustrating. And that's a say, you know, you ride to underestimate. It doesn't look that difficult on paper. It was a lot more climbing in that than, than you think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So you and I, a few years back, were talking and uh, just kind of probably after a ride going over some things, and I had mentioned to you some interest in participating in a triathlon. Mm-hmm. And not long after that, you made it a goal. You want to tell me about that goal? Uh, yeah. So that's, that's kind of a, kind of a long story. The ultimate goal was, um, to swim open water in the ocean with my wife, Anne, uh, on a a trip that we had, we had planned a a cruise to Hawaii. Um, coming into it, coming into that goal, what you really need to understand, and we've talked about this, I had a complete fear of, of the water. Um, I nearly drowned twice as a little kid and it was really kind of paralyzing to the point is, so, so the, the goal wasn't the triathlons, the, the triathlons was the means to get, to set little goals on the ultimate goal of being able to, to swim out in the open water on this vacation with Ann. Um, and I realized that just setting that out there as itself wasn't going to be enough. I needed the little individual goals. And then the talk that we had about triathlons probably triggered that. Uh, and I hate running and still do. So that was part of the pain that had to go along with that. Um, but I was, I was committed to get that done. Really, it was an e- enormous fear. I mean, to give you an idea, and I think I wrote this down. Um, so uh, the coach I had, Marty, bless her heart, uh, I'd, I can't imagine anybody with more patience than her because it literally took me 12 sessions in the pool with her, a total of 31 trips to, to the pool on my own before I got one lap in. Um, and most of that, probably if that's 31, I'm guessing probably 28 of those, I wouldn't go in the deep end. The first several times dozen i don't know that i did go into the deep end with uh, the uh, side of the pool on my right and the lifeguard right there and marty swimming right next to me 
I could feel my heart rate double when we crossed over that line from, uh, you know, the shallow end to the deep end. So that's how uh, emotionally deep and straining. And I I share that with you because I I run into people often who say, uh, you know, oh, well, I didn't know how to swim either. And then as I talk to them, I realize, okay, well, there's a difference between uh, this massive fear of water and just not knowing how to swim. You know, being able to jump in the pool and get to the top and knowing that you're not going to drown, even though if you can't swim forward or if you can't tread water for longer than a minute, totally different situation, just to put some perspective on this. And uh, another credit uh, to Marty is one my very first lesson that I had with her, and she just had me put my head under the water, and that was a struggle, and getting used to breathing and turning my head, just standing in the forefoot end and, and getting comfortable being in the water. But from the very beginning, she st- she was talking about swimming in Pine View and doing open water swims. And I remember thinking and saying to her, I said, Marty, you might as well be saying, Joel, in four months, you're going to be able to jump to the moon because that's how ridiculous this, I- this idea was to me. Uh-huh. Um, and she stuck with me through that whole thing. Um, and that that's probably the toughest thing that I've ever had to do, not because it was so not it wasn't physically tough, it was mentally tough. That makes sense. Yeah, swimming is difficult enough, and then to have to overcome a deep-seated fear like that, that's a pretty impressive feat. Pretty impressive accomplishment. And to wrap up that triathlon season, a month before we went to Hawaii, uh, I I participated in an open water uh, Olympic distance uh, event in in Twin Falls, Idaho. Uh, I was just incredibly grateful to everybody that helped me get there. Uh, Just to get to the starting line uh, was uh, an amazing accomplishment. So now you've learned to mountain bike, you've done... I don't know how many thousands of miles you've learned to swim, you've completed a triathlon. What's next? How do you keep yourself challenged and motivated? To me, life is about keeping yourself challenged. My thought is that we've got, you know, life is hard. I, I mean, it's difficult things are going to happen to you. And my philosophy for a very long time has been, you need to, uh, if, if you purposely do things that are mentally difficult, then you're going to be mentally stronger for when the non-purposeful things about life come and get thrown at you. Yeah, I think they call that practice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something magical just happens when you set yourself a big, hairy, audacious goal. I've heard people call it BHAGs. Your mind goes to work to figure out what you need to do to achieve it. So if we're talking mountain biking, for example, what do you need to do to to train? Nutrition, strength, build your... Once you figure out where you need to be, once you have that goal... You're going to know where you need to be. You're going to figure out what you need to get there. And then you're going to find the people who are going to help you get there and achieve that goal. And that's true for any BHAG goal that you, that you set in your life. It's not just swimming, big mountain bike goals. Um, any, anything that you set up for your life, challenge yourself with those big goals and get there. So I guess here's... Uh, couple of examples since you asked. I mean, coming out of college, I always had a dream of learning to fly. So as soon as I got a real job out of college, that was one of the first things that I, that I did. So that was a challenge. Uh, I left my corporate job and started real estate investing. Uh, and that was, you know, it'd be going from the mentality 
of being, you know, having a regular paycheck coming in to, okay, everything I do going forward is now totally up to me on my own was incredibly rewarding and scary at the same time. Within, and the hardest I had to work for a job was those first two to three years. It was absolutely ridiculous how much time we put in. So we've, uh, we, you know, we've, we've done hard things, both Ann and I are over our entire life, mostly on purpose, mostly because we enjoy the challenge. You ask me what's next. Yep. So this year, the focus um, is really on, uh, I would like to drop more weight. I still feel like I've got uh, some fat around the belly to get rid of. Don't we all? Yeah. Um, and, and really build muscle. I've hired a coach to help with that. So we got a nutrition plan. I've only been doing this for two weeks, so it's hard to judge how it's going. Sure. A couple other challenges are uh, the mountain bike coaching. Uh, to continue to get better at that and figure out, you know, what I want to do with that, with that bit, with that business. And the, the, the podcast has been a huge learning experience. So getting feedback from, uh, from people and even the stuff that you shared with me before you started with this is, is super helpful. Yeah. You've got a lot going on. So tell me more about your mountain bike coaching. What motivated you to go down that road? There was a pretty significant personal investment to to go through that course and to take this on. What what motivates you? Why did you want to do that? Well, it's it's funny because initially it was selfish. Um, I've always believed and and proven to myself that if you want to get better at something. Go and teach it. I've done that through different uh, businesses and uh, career that I've had. So I thought, okay, if I learn how to coach, then I'm going to become a better rider. Because my first, and I think you were the same way, Scott, the first three or four years of my riding, I didn't spend a second with a coach. It was all self-taught and trial and error and a lot of error. And a lot of crashing. It's a great way to learn bad habits. <laughs> yeah. Hard to unlearn. I was I was descending, seated on my saddle. Granted, I did use the dropper and lowered the dropper, but I had no clue that you were supposed to stand up when you were going downhill. You, you don't know what you don't know. That's right. So when, once I realized, okay, coaching is a good idea for me to do, then I started doing it every year. So uh, last spring, the thought was, well, if I learn how to coach then that's going to be my training to become a better rider. I also did it to the Goal uh, Kids Camp. The Goal Foundation has a kids, kids camp each summer. Yeah, we've done that together. Yep. A pretty cool experience. But that was super cool. And I, and I did it because of that. I wanted to be more effective at that. And I figured by taking that course, it was going to help. And it certainly did. And then I also did it because I wanted to help and get into mountain biking more. She had gone a couple times with me, but not much. Uh, they tell you not to coach your spouse, which I think is excellent advice. Uh, and we have survived so far. Is this wood? It is wood. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I think a lot of that is because we've, we've, uh, you know, we've been married pushing 35 years this year. And also have run uh, multiple businesses together, pretty much our uh, almost our whole married life. So, um, you know, it was a uh, it was a struggle, um, and we both learned through it. But it was it was worthwhile. So those were the three things I wanted to get out of it. Um, I did not expect. As here, here's the bottom line: with the podcast and with the coaching, I'm basically making no money. I'm doing it for the joy of doing it. The cost of insurance for the coaching is is ridiculous. Um, so for, through the first year and a half, I've lost money. It's going to be a stretch to, to break even this year. Um, but I do it because whether it's in a clinic or one-on-one, -on -one, when I see the improvement that I can help someone make and I'm able and I know that I the way I communicated help them do that and they're going to be safer and have more fun on the trails that's incredibly rewarding to me and I didn't expect that so that that's why I continue it that's great you've also found a way to kind of make it give back to the community as well I know you're not a huge fan of group clinics <laughs> but you've put several of them together that you have offered for free in return for a donation to local nonprofits. 
Uh, that's pretty awesome. You want to talk about why you decided to go that way? Yeah. So it's it's not that I don't like clinics. I don't like what people charge for them based on the value that you get out of it. You look at the coach to, to student ratio of clinics. I think that uh, out of all the ones that I've been to, because I've been to several, the uh, the best I saw was maybe like one to eight or one to ten. Well, you've you've been to a lot too. Yeah. What, what do you see? Together. Yeah. Similar. That's that's the ratio that's pretty typical, and it seems like there's always one or two people who kind of demand a coach's time and attention more than the others. Right. So it's not always equitable for everybody. Right. Yeah. You're fighting for attention. Yeah. Yep. yep. To some extent you are. However, the one, the clinics that I've been to, I mean, I always glean something great out of them. Mm -hmm. I've even done some clinics that the skills I considered to be well below me. And there's always, always something that I learn and take away from those clinics. For sure. Yeah. You, there's, there's definitely value there. Um, but when I looked at my, um, uh, the pricing that I was going to do for the uh, the pricing that I'm currently doing for my like two hour private coaching is a tad more than what you're going to spend on a three hour group clinic, but the value is significantly more more because all you get is me. So it's again, it's not like I I don't like clinics. I just don't like what what people are charging for. I understand it from a business model point of view that it makes sense to do those because you you're you know you get the biggest value of your return sure but like we had said you know i'm not really doing this for the money so the clinics that i'm doing um this year i did start asking uh and quote unquote charging uh, asking people to give directly to a nonprofit trailer organization of their choice and i do that because i want to see that they've got some skin in the game versus just doing free ones so if they've got skin in the game that tells me that they're probably going to show up and they're going to show up with the attitude is, okay, I, I just put in, in some money for this. So I'm, I'm here and I'm ready to learn. That makes sense. Um, and, you know, it's, it's no secret. And you and I have talked about this is, you know, as, as a result of that, I'm going to, you know, if I, if I have a, a clinic that with eight people in it, I'm probably going to get one or two. They come to me after and say, hey, let's do some private lessons. Yeah, of course. So, you know, part of it's uh, marketing, but, you know, there's other ways to market that um, that would probably take a lot less time <laughs> and generate the same results. You should always buy a Facebook ad or a Google ad. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a few clicks away. Yep, for sure. So speaking of things that you do profit to yourself, what's the deal with this podcast? Where did this idea come from? This just popped into me. Let me back up because you you asked earlier about uh, you know uh, the, some of the challenges that I'm going through right now. I first started riding around age 50, so a lot of people will say, uh, "Well, I've I've felt like you know I've been getting slower for a long time." So if you've been riding since like tw your 20s or maybe as a teenager, you've probably felt that you're getting older and slower for the last. And if you're 50 now. For the last 30 years, you felt like you've been getting older and slower for the entire time. For me, and you probably experienced this too, the, the first four or five years, I felt like I was getting younger because I was, I, I've I medically probably was getting younger because I was getting fitter. I was getting faster. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that felt great. And over the last really year or two, I've started to feel like I'm starting to slow down. Last year, I started thinking, you know, I know a lot of people that like are in their 50s, 60s, and even a few in their 70s that are still riding. They've probably felt this for a long time. And when I started paying, you know, kind of put that kind of filter on when I started looking to see what the what the mountain bike industry was doing, the, the, the focus seemed to be ignoring aging riders. So I thought, you know, there's an awful lot that we can learn as riders that are that are aging to keep us riding on the dirt a lot longer. 
so that's it just came to me while I was on a ride and then shortly and then later on in the ride I mean because you you know one of the reasons I write solo is my 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 brain just goes free and I come up with some of the best uh, ideas I think for is you know when I'm not trying to get come up with an idea so I started thinking oh, okay what am I going to call this thing and then aging on dirt just popped in my head and uh, and then I posted on the Weaver Davis Facebook group and said, hey, what do you guys think about this idea? And everybody was positive. Um, so I just I just started running with it. Um, I've been fortunate to find, uh, I think, really good guests. I've been getting great feedback from the people, people that are listening to it. So it, I guess it seems to be working. Just an idea that came out of the clear blue while you were riding by yourself. <laughs> completely unlike today when you had somebody chattering in your ears <laughs> for all 20 miles. Uh, except when the climbs got harder, even on the e-bikes, uh, I think we both st stopped chattering. <laughs> Not me. I was talking the whole time. No, I don't think so. <laughs> My heart rate never got over 120, Joel. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. In doing the podcast, you've done several episodes now. Has there been any downside to doing that? Any problems or issues that you've kind of created for yourself in the process? Yeah, that's that's actually a good question. I think um, to contrast with the uh, with the coaching with the podcast, there's no immediate feedback. So I don't because I'm recording these sometimes weeks or months in advance because I'm I'm uh, I'm dropping them every other week. So I don't I don't get any immediate feedback, and even after they drop, I mean it's just the nature of people and podcasts. So I get it. I mean, I, I listen to several podcasts and I, I never, I never provide any feedback to anybody either. So I think that's, that's the frustrating part is, um, I, I don't know what kind of impact it's having every once in a while. I'll, I'll run into people on the trail and they'll tell me, Hey, I listened to your last podcast or I've listened to all of them and I'm really getting a lot out of it. Keep it going. And, and I love hearing that because really that's the only reward that come from it. Um, I do get educated myself while I'm doing them, so I think that's that's super helpful. I, I guess that's the biggest thing is just the lack of feedback. So uh, if you know if you're a regular listener and you're getting stuff out of this, let me know because that's my my fuel to to keep these things going. Yeah, that makes sense. So you already talked about skiing, and I've uh, I took up snowboarding a little over a year ago, and you and I have been skiing boarding together. A couple of times. Mm -hmm. What else do you do in the winter? Well, it's it's funny because being in northern Utah, we are. I am incredibly spoiled. So I I, I have so I I fat bike in addition to ski. So basically, what I do in the winter is if it's a powder day, I am skiing at Powder Mountain, and if it's not, and the trail the groom trails at North Fork of the Nordic are firm, I'm riding the fat bike. Nice. So. Uh, those are my two tough decisions uh, when I get up every morning for what I what I want to do. Sounds like you've got a rough, Joel. Yeah, yeah. And just kind of as a as a side note, we used to have um, multiple races in the Ogden Valley in the winter for fat bike races. Um, and I'm hoping, fingers crossed, heard some rumors of people trying to get one or two of those back this winter. So I'm hoping that happens. And I'm even, uh, if somebody's willing to take the lead on that, I'm willing to put some work in and, and make that happen. Well, this, this is a blast. That's winter for me. Awesome. You've got a good life, Joel. <laughs> no, no complaints. <laughs> cool. So you and I have known each other for several years. Uh, we pretty much started riding about the same time, and we've ran quite a bit together. We've gone on some road trips together. But it just amazes me how much you can learn when you sit down and talk to somebody, something besides a trail talk. I think people are going to really appreciate you sharing your story and how you got here. And I would imagine there will be a lot of people inspired by where you started, where you are today, and kind of your attitude towards giving back to the community. I've done a couple of clinics with Joel. I have to be honest with you. I don't know a more patient coach out there or anybody who is good at adapting to what a rider needs. He just genuinely wants you to be a better, safer rider 
because it's fun. If you are having fun, then he's satisfied with the work he's done and the people around you are safer and having fun. It's just win-win from every angle. So I highly recommend that you reach out to Joel and make arrangements to get some lessons. If you're somebody who's been writing for many, many years, there's still something to learn. It's it's very much worthwhile to to get a lesson. And as Joel mentioned earlier, you don't know what you don't know until you do. That's real kind of you. Thanks for for suggesting that. And anybody can find my my coaching info on my website. It's just uh, jzmtb.com. What else, Joel? What else would you like to chat about in closing? I think this is the main lesson with all of us, and it's the formula that's always worked for me for any goal, no matter how big. It starts with the why. Why do you want to do what you want to do? The stronger the reason, the more likely you're going to be able to make it happen. And then you're going to put together a plan to get to it and then fully commit to that plan. Once you've committed, you'll find the people – out there to help you get get it done. And you can do it. You can make anything happen that you want to make happen. Awesome. Thanks, Joel. This has been fun. All right. Thanks, Scott. Well, that's another lap around the bike park for Aging on Dirt. I hope you've learned something and or found this entertaining. Most importantly, go out and apply what you've learned so you can experience more joy on your bike. Remember, Joel wants your input. What topics and or guests do you want to hear? Reach out to him where you're listening to the podcast, on Facebook, or find his email slash phone on his coaching website, jzmtb.com. Until next time, have fun and be safe out there.